welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. The topic for this month's show are the Voyager missions, Voyager 1 and 2. And with me here in the studio to uh, go over this uh, fascinating chapter in NASA history is our own Kevin Medden, one of our AFE team members. Kevin, welcome back to this side of the camera. Thank you. Now, Voyager was the, uh, the grand tour of the solar system, but can you tell us a little bit about the U.S. space program before the Voyager missions? Well, as you might imagine, any program of the Voyager nature is more complicated than, it, you know, so that we're probably talking it began in the 60s when they had that really long name called the, I think it was Jupiter, or Saturn, Mariner or something, or, but, but anyway, yeah. We, what were we all about in that era? We were all about the manned space program. Oh yes, we threw up some uh, Mariner missions to the planets and also we needed unmanned missions to go to the moon before we landed a man on it. But the point I was trying to make in this history was you get to, you get to the part where Armstrong's already landed on the moon and you know Nixon hears about this great idea that NASA has about a space shuttle. All of a sudden Nixon says, well, let's get rid of 18, 19, and 20. Apollo 17 will be our, you know, our last uh, moon landing. And that's exactly what happened. So from a man perspective, the only thing we had from that point on was, I believe, three Skylab missions, right. which essentially was just parts of the Apollo program you know, where we created a habitat for uh, you know, the astronauts up there. And then we had Apollo Soyuz. And of course, at that time, we thought the shuttle was going to go up a lot sooner than it did. Well, that's true. It had some teething problems, so I kind of always looked at as Voyagers, kind of that bridge. Yes, we had Viking going to Mars, and the sister um, spacecraft before Voyager were the Pioneer program, and you know they went out. And but Voyager was probably that bridge, where and just to go back in history a little bit. Remember the old TV show Nightline? Oh, sure. And remember, every time there was a Voyager flyby, Ted Koppel always had Gene uh, Cernan on, the last man to walk on the moon. And he was always, you know, really giddy about the images. And I think that's essentially what Voyager was. It was that reminder that we still had a space program, even though we still had this longer than unusual wait for, you know, the, the shuttle to actually start up. Sending people back up again. Right. To the and space it, station and, and rather than to the moon. Because even think about some of the flybys, they happened after the Challenger disaster. So even in that respect, it was like a catharsis. While we were mourning the loss of those astronauts, we still had these, you know, little machines of ours going up there and giving us something to smile about. Yep. And uh, they, they took some fabulous, fabulous pictures. Yeah, that was probably, you know, to not to digress too much, but that was probably the most fascinating thing about researching this program, especially now that the December issue of Sky and Tell magazine is out, and it has some remarkable images from the Juno spacecraft. So you really appreciate the quality of what the Voyager missions did compared to what we see now. So you can see where, you know, there's a, been a big leap in technology. And they've done a pretty good job, too, with reprocessing some of these old Voyager pictures to really bring out some additional clarity. Yeah, and I was kind of disappointed in NASA. They didn't have, like, an archival section where we could have zeroed in on the Voyager pictures and found them real simple. Every time I went to NASA for Voyager, all I got was information about what they're doing in the present and not what they did 40 years ago. And that, and that was kind of frustrating because I looked at a picture and I'm like, that's a beautiful picture of Saturn, but... Is that from Cassini or is that from Voyager? <laughs> exactly. You know. But, you know, finally in the early mid-70s, Congress finally decided, okay, this program is worth funding. And as some people have, have heard, you know, they put together the grand tour, which will get, you know, will be talked about in detail, I believe, in turn with Steve Woody. But, you know, once they did that, they started putting the, uh, the orbiter together and decided what instruments they wanted. And... Uh, this is the beginning of what should be our photo montage here. All right, well, let's take a look. And there's your picture, and that could be Voyager 1 or Voyager 2, because obviously they were twins and they had the same apparatus. But 
again, think about it. That was built, you know, over 40 years ago. And, you know, think of what we're designing, you know, in the 21st century right now. And I believe the next shot is a brief explanation of, uh, you know, what you have. Obviously, you need the high gain antenna because you uh, need to be able to listen to the uh, spacecraft and also communicate what the next maneuver is going to be. Exactly. The magnetometer, I'm assuming, came in handy because you would want to know the magnetic fields of various planets. And, in fact, you know, you know the scientists have discovered that, you know, the planets have a, a weirder, you know, magnetic field than they thought. And, and I will say that I couldn't tell you exactly which one of these are still operating 40 years later, but there are a few, so they are still in contact with them. So as feeble as their signals are, they, they can still, still be heard. And one of the things that the both uh, Voyagers took up with them is the uh, famous gold disc. Exactly. And that was the, I guess you could say, that was the attempt to summarize what we are as a planet. As a civilization, as a people on this planet, sure. Because everything from the types of animals to nature sounds to, I believe they used the word, was it hello was the term they used? How many ways you could say hello in each language on Earth, or at least as many languages as they could quantify. Sure, and, and be able to fit on the record uh, the sights and sounds of our planet, uh, as you mentioned, you know, birds and... Uh, and finally in the uh, late, I believe it was in the middle of 1977, we, uh, we actually had liftoff for the Voyager mission. And if you remember your history correctly, Voyager 2 went off first. Yes, it did, yeah. You know, because again, because of the orbital mechanics and what they were trying to do, they had to line it up differently. So, uh, and without, again, getting into gravity assist in a whole bit, it made its way to its first stop, which was the planet Jupiter. All right, well, let's take a look. And again, we've, we've been there before with Pioneer, and obviously we've been there later with our other missions, but there is your basic, you know, shot of what we first saw of Jupiter, other than what the largest telescopes on Earth were giving us. And, and again, a great shot of the great red spot. Which, and, and that shot doesn't look very red, but again, without getting into the complications of astrophotography, there are a variety of ways of adjusting the color on any picture that you happen to see. Oh, sure. And next up is, now you can see a, a color difference here, how it, from that angle, the, the colors are a little richer. Exactly. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say that the uh, black spot we see is a moon transiting the planet. Or one, at least one, the shadow. Yeah, one of the Galilean moons, mm -hmm. it's shadow sure. transiting. Because, you know, sometimes these, uh, the synopsis of these uh, photographs weren't very detailed. Now here's probably at least what I consider the most interesting shot of the Jupiter flyby, only because nobody, I think, was thinking the term volcano when they were thinking moons of Jupiter. Right. And Lindo, right. Linda Morabito was the young lady who discovered that shot, and some people give her credit for calling it a volcano, but she actually went to her senior people at the JPL because it was a Jet Propulsion Laboratory that actually runs the unmanned programs. Not, it doesn't come from you know Houston or from Florida. Okay. And after, in fact, they went. They had a shot where somebody tried to say, "Well, that is another planet or another moon going behind Io." And no, they actually discovered that after looking at it and analyzing it deeper, that they discovered that the ugly pizza of moon yeah. was actually had <laughs> volcanic activity. It was actually alive. And Europa gets a lot of the credit for possibly future missions, but yet the most interesting Voyager discovery, for, in some respects, was on an isle. Finding that, that volcanism somewhere other than the planet Earth. Right, and yeah. which, of course, now has spread like wildfire to a lot of different planets. and Planets and moons, moons. of planets. Uh, even Triton at uh, right. Neptune has right. uh, also got uh, some volcanic activity. And there's what I like to call the uh, family shot for the planet Jupiter. And that would be, in no particular order, Callisto, uh, Ganymede, uh, Io, and Europa. Yeah. There the four is. main Galilean moons who, for those who aren't aware, are named after Galileo because he actually saw them through his telescope in 1609.
Fascinating photo, fascinating photo indeed. Well, we've got a lot more photos and a lot more discussion to, uh, to bring you, but we're going to have to stop for a moment and take a quick break. If you have any questions, of course, send us an email. We love to receive those, read them, and respond back. You can see the address down there at the bottom of your screen. And uh, coming up next is Stephen Witte with Term of the Month. So we'll see you in just a moment. Thanks, Don. The term of the month is gravity assist. In a gravity assist, a spacecraft's direction and speed is changed as it goes by a planet. There's something called the Oberth effect that says that if propulsion is used while the spacecraft is close to the planet, then it gets more uh, of an effect, more of a speed change than, um, uh, than if it's farther away. So Voyager 1 flew by closer to Jupiter and it used this to gain more speed than Voyager 2 got. Uh, so it is moving away from the sun faster than Voyager 2. Mariner 10 and Messenger used gravity assist to slow down, and Ulysses used it to change the plane of its orbit from within you know, the planets to a, a, a solar polar orbit. And that is the term of the month, gravity assist. Back to you, Don. Thanks, Stephen, and welcome back. We're talking about the Voyager 1 and 2 missions on their 40th anniversary. So, Kevin, let's continue. And onward and upward, we're going to go to Saturn for our next uh, picture here. And, Great. Uh, and again, I had a lot of choices for photos, but a couple of them I took were artist renderings, if you were, or you know, computer-generated type shots. This is you know what it would have looked like had you could actually see a flyby in person, and this is. Voyager 1 making its uh, pass around the ringed planet and there's a typical shot that you got from the Voyager mission of arguably the most beautiful planet in the solar system for most people. Yep. I know yep. some people are picking and would pick another one just to be different and you know and essentially I, I tried to sh short shift Saturn only because we knew we were going back. For our next two planets we can't say that because we ain't been back, and we may not be going back for a long time. That's true. So we'll spend some more time with the, uh, the twin gas giants. Yes, and I know all the kids in the audience are going to appreciate this, but we are going to call it Uranus. Absolutely. And there's that beautiful cue ball in the sky right there, Uranus. And, you know, they had no idea what to expect. They did know previous to this that it did have rings, because there is a procedure for figuring that out, so they figured that out, and from that artist rendering, you can tell that the rings are completely, I wouldn't say different than Saturn, but obviously not as pronounced. Not nearly as grand, no. Right, but nonetheless, using a technique, I believe, with a, a star occulting the planet, I believe yes. it was, they were able to uh, determine that what, what was causing the, the light shift they were seeing had to be a, a ring around the planet, so... Uh, and I believe our next shot is of one of the moons of Saturn, which is a regular, a rather, Uranus. Oh, yep. Yeah, Uranus, rather. Thank you. And this is kind of interesting because we're in the season of Halloween, and I read a description of the moon Miranda, and someone said, it's very much like Frankenstein. And I thought that was very apropos for the Halloween You look season. at the terrain, and it looks like you grabbed a, one type of terrain, and then another type and just stuck it all together. Right. You would think it was a mosaic of multiple shots of multiple surfaces from many moons, but that is strictly one of the main moons of Uranus, and that is Miranda. And I guess we should also mention that these are the ice giants that we're covering now, and not... It used to be, as some people called all these planets, the gaseous planets, but technically yes. that should stop with Saturn. Yeah, yeah. So now onward and up to, upward to Neptune which now is our last planet in our uh, solar system since Pluto got Demoted, yeah, evicted. it wasn't at the time, but it is now. Sure. And we all know about the famous red spot on Jupiter, but this is the famous dark spot on Neptune. And if the information I have is correct, apparently you can't find that dark spot anymore. They've been looking that, and it apparently yeah, disappeared. That this storm did not have the legs or the length of time the way the red spot, which some people figure could be four or 500 years old on Jupiter. It's been there since Galileo. Oh, right, took exactly. Mm -hmm. And then our next shot from our Neptune flyby is uh, 
one of the major moons of the Neptunian or Neptunian system, if you prefer, and that would be Triton. Exactly. Very and, unique and again, terrain. Very unique terrain. And somebody said it looked like a cantaloupe. It does sort of have that <laughs> texture. Yep, down there at the, uh, and, I would think would be the southern end of the... And you should savor that shot because, like we said earlier, it's going to be a long time before you see anything like that because, as far as I know, there is nothing in NASA's data bank that says we're going back in the next 30 yeah. years. So what and do we have next? What's up next here? <laughs> oh, another close-up of the dark spot. Ah, <laughs> yes. And uh, what's interesting about that spot is where the energy came from to drive it, considering that Neptune is so far away from the sun. There. Right, and the, those swirls you see on the outside make you almost think of a an Earth-like hurricane. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And the uh, next uh, image we should be seeing here is a poster that describes eloquently what is happening now with the Voyager mission, which is humanity's farthest journey. Exactly, Cause, cause so it, it brings up the, the question, you know, where are they now? And that's probably a really good question because if you, as you can see by this diagram, this diagram moves from right to left or toward the or, or, or toward the spacecraft. And as I understand the diagram, we're in the solar system proper. Then we get to the termination so shock zone. Then you move up to the slowdown region into stagnation, into depletion. As you get ready to enter what they call the heliopause, which is sort of that transitional zone as we're getting away from the influence of the sun and the solar wind. Mm -hmm. Getting ready to get into the, I believe they call it the helio sheave, and then you finally get into what they call interstellar space. Right. And, you know, both of these, you know, one is racing a little bit faster than two, but it's only because if you look at some of the diagrams, which can get complicated, at least for, my, for me it was complicated, it was the orbit or diagram that they picked that, that got one out quicker because two obviously had to cover the final two planets before it right. could get on its planned trajectory. Yeah, the one is, is following the, the plane of the solar system, and the other headed straight up. And the uh, next shot is family portrait of Jupiter, Saturn, mm -hmm. and, Uranus, and Neptune. And they, they I figure it's probably the only we'll time you'll there. see all those but four in a they montage like that. Really and and so. the last image that we're going to cover is probably the most famous. And I know it doesn't look like anything, and I get that, but from the point of the cultural perspective of this whole mission and what is Earth's relationship to the rest of our universe, the little teeny tiny dot that you see there. Yeah, with the arrow is pointing to it. Hopefully the folks on, on TV at home can see that. Yeah, that'd be us. It's a pale blue dot. It's, yeah, the yeah. pale blue dot, which, as many of you know, was... Carl Sagan's follow-up book to his more famous book, Cosmos. That's right. That's and, right. and he essentially said, we're an insignificant planet in a little corner of our universe, in a galaxy that's insignificant, in an island of galaxies that probably outnumber the people on, in the universe. Exactly. Now, in that shot, too, I also saw some vertical lines from uh, and I'm, top to bottom I was kind of get. I was guessing, I may be incorrect, but I was kind of guessing that those were possibly the rings of Neptune. I wasn't really sure. Or yeah, Neptune has rings as well. You know, so, but somebody with more knowledge of astrophotography could probably analyze that a little bit better. And like I always do, Don, when you and I get together and have these discussions, I'd like to tell people where they can get more information. And, of course, I stole the article, or the, the, this show was stolen by, from Astronomy Magazine because they did an excellent job. So if you want a synopsis of 40 years, this is the way to go. That was an excellent article. I have that magazine and, at home myself. Uh, Jim Bell did this book called The Interstellar Age. Now Jim Bell's more famous for his work on Mars where he has been a part of Spirit and Opportunity as well as Curiosity. And he wrote this book and it's, yeah, you, t you get the flybys and everything in it, but you also get stories about the people. And some of these people, their marriages broke up. You know, their, you know life happened to them. Yeah. In a, in, and some people, in fact, have 
where part of, say, the Jupiter flyby, they left it to do onward and upward things, and 30 years later, they're coming back because they, they just can't get enough Voyager. And because, you know, now that we're heading into inter interstellar space, people want to be a part of any kind of discovery that they may have before these um, two, what do you want to call them, spacecraft give up the ghost, which some people are guessing will be around 2025. And finally, the last book here by Mr. Jim P or Stephen Pine. Again, this book is kind of uh, the cultural aspect of it. It kind of gets you into where we were as a country in that era and you know how fascinated we were with the whole experience. So I mean, I th so anybody that wants to short shift the unmanned spacecraft program of NASA, I think should look back and see some of the fascinating things that happened in this era because to me they're just as exciting as anything we've done from the man perspective. I think so. I mean, you look at what we've done with Cassini, and now Juno's out there now, you've got Curiosity. Fantastic discoveries where we haven't risked life and limb. Uh, for Mars, they've said that what it takes Curiosity months to do, a person could do in a few hours. Well, that's true enough, but here again, there's a whole different set of things you have to consider when you're sending people out there because you want to get them back. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the uh, robotic space missions have been totally fascinating. And, I mean, not to change the subject here, but if anybody's, you know, interested in that, just go to the NASA app or the NASA website because there are plenty of exciting missions getting planned and uh, some are ready to go off in uh, 2018, which we will be talking about here on AFE. I'm sure we will. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we will. Well, Kevin, I'd like to uh, thank you for... Uh, bringing this interesting topic to us on the 40th anniversary of the Voyager spacecrafts. Uh, as always, visit our club website. Uh, we'll put the address down at the bottom of the screen for you to jot down and check out at your earliest convenience. And coming up next is What's Up with Stephen Woody, so stay tuned for him. And uh, hope you enjoyed the show, and we'll see you again. Thanks, Don. Uh, what's up for November 2017? So, on the 1st of November, the uh, astronomical night starts an hour and 35 minutes before sunrise, which is at 8.06 a.m., and sunset is at 6.25 p.m., and an hour and 35 minutes later, uh, astronomical night starts. On the 30th, so that's a month later, uh, astronomical night ends an hour and 40 minutes before sunrise, which is at 7.41 a.m., uh, and sunset is at 5.02 p.m. Then an hour and 40 minutes later, we have astronomical night start. So these are, uh, you know, a point near Detroit in Michigan, uh, and the, the times will vary for you depending on where you are in your time zone and where you are on the planet. And... Um, so the, the days are getting shorter uh, up here in the uh, far north, as it is. Uh, in the southern hemisphere, the days would be getting longer. Uh, the uh, full moon starts us off on the 4th of uh, November. On the, yes, on the, we've got a mislabeled image. Wow. Uh, you know, naughty me. So uh, we have a third quarter on November 10th. We have a new moon on the 18th, um, which we'll get back to. And then we have the first quarter on the 26th. Um, so here in, uh, we're going to look at Venus, uh, which is in Virgo and moving to Libra uh, here on the 1st of November at 7.05 a.m., uh, a time chosen so that Jupiter is... Uh, far enough away from the sun, yet the sun hasn't quite risen yet. So Venus uh, rises at 6.40 at the beginning of the month uh, on a day like today uh, on this image, and uh, at 6.54 a.m., so quite a bit later by the end of the month, its magnitude minus 3.8, it's really quite bright. 
uh, uh, Venus is better at the start of the month. Mars, uh, shown here above, uh, is also in Virgo. It rises uh, between 5.17 and uh, 3.57, almost 4 a.m., uh, and it is better at the end of the month as it uh, it'll be farther from the sun at the end of the month. Jupiter is also in Virgo. It rises at 7.44 to 5.22 a.m. over the course of the month, and it is also better at the end of the month. Uh, it just had its superior conjunction, and it's getting farther and farther from the sun in the morning. Uh, on the 23rd of November, uh, Mercury is at greatest eastern elongation. So that just means that it's farthest from the sun. So it's the easiest time to look at Mercury. Um, it's an evening object. Uh, it's in Libra to Sagittarius. So shown here, it's in Sagittarius. Uh, you can see the teapot sort of to the left where Saturn and Pluto are. Um, so it sets at 6.54, almost 7 p.m. And, uh, and, uh, th and at 6.06 .06 p.m., just about 6 by the end of the month, um, Saturn uh, is in Ophiuchus. Ophiuchus is kind of a weird-shaped um, constellation. So um, Ophiuchus to Sagittarius over the course of the month. So Saturn usually doesn't move, but it, do, it does this month, uh, crossing a boundary. It sets at 8.55 p.m. to 6.14 p.m. over the course of the month. It's better at the end of the month as it hits uh, superior conjunction on the winter solstice. In, uh, dis on December 21st. Uh, Neptune, uh, we happen to have the moon here. Neptune is next up. It's in Aquarius, where it has been and will be for a long time. It is magnitude 7.9, so that is not naked eye. You'll need at least binoculars, and you'll need a decent sky chart. Uh, it sets from 10.30 to 7.43 p.m., and it's better at the start of the month because it's... Um, uh, you know, because it, it sets uh, earlier and earlier. Pluto is in Sagittarius. It's magnitude 14, so you'll need a 10-inch scope or better. It sets 1034 to, oh, it sets uh, very much, very similar. It sets actually uh, um, at midnight by the end of the month. Uh, don't miss the Leonid meteor shower on the 17th and 18th, uh, the, sort of the night of the 17th. Um, uh, the the meteors come from uh, Comet Temple Tuttle. Uh, we have a new moon this year, so it should be great. Don't forget to dress warm, even if you're in uh, warmer climates. Uh, expect 10 to 20 an hour. And that's what's up for November uh, 2017. Uh, the show is free, but we may tax your brain.